No, it's not. It should be. Oh, okay. Huh. Okay. If everyone could take their seats so we can begin. The subcommittee on consumer protection and commerce will come to order. Um, we are uh, meeting um, today uh, to consider eight bills. Um, due to the um, COVID public health emergency, members can participate uh, in, uh, in today's hearing either in person or remotely via online video, uh, video conference. For members who are participating remotely, you, your microphones will be set on mute for the purpose of eliminating background noise. Members participating remotely will need to unmute your microphones each time that you wish to speak. Please note, that uh, once you are unmuted, your micro uh, once you unmute unmuted your microphone, you know that anything that uh, that you say um, in WebEx will be heard over the loudspeaker in the uh, in the committee room and subject to being heard by um, uh, C-SPAN and, uh, and and live uh, and, and yeah. You, you, we can hear what you say. Um, dur dur during, uh, uh, during voice votes, members participating remotely um, will need to unmute so that, uh, that we can hear your response. During uh, recorded votes, you will need to unmute yourself after you... Uh, um, after you, um, your, your name is called to respond to the clerk. In response to the clerk, we are asking that instead of just saying uh, I or no, um, that you respond with uh, something like, although not exactly, something like Jan Schakowsky from Illinois votes I. Um, this will uh, provide additional time for the voting um, member to be um, identified and um, made visible on the, uh, on the platform. Since members are participating from different locations um, at, uh, at today's markup, all recognition of members will be in the order of um, subcommittee seniority. During this markup, um, amendments will be sent to members electronically. If members participating in person would like a paper copy of an amendment or bill, please alert staff during the um, consideration of the amendment or bill. Otherwise, you can find it on your cell phone or uh, laptop. Um, Amendments are uh, amendments and motions should be sent to Clory Rodriguez and Perry Hamilton, and documents for the record to Ed Kazmarski at the uh, at, um, at the um, at the email addresses that have been provided to your staff. Documents for the record will be entered into the record at the end of the markup. And at this point, we'll begin with some opening statements. And I recognize myself to begin for five minutes of an opening statement. Let me say that uh, this is a great day. And in the proud tradition of the Great Energy and Commerce Committee, and the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Commerce. Um, today, we will be considering bipartisan, uh, bipartisan bills, eight of them, um, that will protect consumers and strengthen the economy. 
Following last week's dynamic hearing, um, we will today mark up the American Data Privacy and Protection Act. This markup will um, add to the growing momentum toward delivering for the American people in federal law the fundamental digital protection rights. I have been very proud to work with my uh, ranking member, Mr. Bilirakis, Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Rogers, as, we, as, as well as many other members of this subcommittee in bringing us to this moment. Other bills that we will be considering today cover a range of, uh, of topics to enhance consumer safety, inclusion, et cetera. The um, Secure uh, Notarization Act um, will um, uh, offer consumers a convenient way to um, notarize their documents um, remotely. The Reese Law, introduced by Representative Kelly on our subcommittee, will protect children from deadly button cell batteries that can be easily ingested. The PAST Act um, ends the cruel practice of horse soaring. The uh, SAFE Act um, uh, it introduced by Representative um, Bouchon and myself um, and the slaughter of horses for human consumption, the informed, informing consumers about Small Device, Devices Act introduced by Representative Curtis um, requires that manufacturers disclose when a camera or recording device is built into certain products. The, the Ransom Act, introduced by Ranking Member Villarakis, um, which uh, it do, requires the FTC um, to report, uh, uh, to, to um, uh, FTC reporting of both ransomware attacks and what the FTC does to respond to those attacks. And the Manufacturing Gov Act, introduced by Representatives uh, Tonko and Upton, which create a center, uh, a, a, um, a centralized uh, website to serve as the primary source of information uh, related to federal manufacturing um, uh, programs. So today, um, the, the bills will um, make Americans' um, daily lives safer and better. Um, in particular, I'm really looking forward to uh, continuing the um, sub substantive and bipartisan discussion of the American Data Privacy and Protection Act as we refine I want to stress that, refine the uh, robust foundation that we have built together. So I hope that we will all agree that this is that we can seize the moment to return control over their data back to the American people. I look forward to um, working with all of my colleagues. I know that there are some changes that have already been made today in the hearing from the hearing that we had last week. There may be more, but we have a very strong framework from which to work, and I look forward to that. So I want to thank everyone who made today's markup possible, and I yield to our ranking member, Mr. Bilawakis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. In, uh, I want to thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this markup. Uh, I'm looking forward to a productive conversation for how we can work in a bipartisan manner to continue to refine 
these bills and move them forward. Uh, this is a great subcommittee. I think most everybody knows that. One with the important role of protecting consumers. That's why I was proud to co-sponsor H.R. 5313, Reese's Law, led by Representative Kelly, which will require CPSC to develop the product safety standards uh, with respect to batteries that pose an ingestion uh, hazard. I want to thank Representative Kelly and uh, Trista Hamsmith, who I worked with, for their tireless advocacy to continue fighting for this effort. While we owe it uh, to our communities, our, our constituents, to be examining whether there are dangerous products in the marketplace and doing so without unduly burning legitimate businesses that follow the law, we are also tasked with ensuring Americans have more transparency over business practices, uh, especially when it comes to business practices involving their data. That's why I'm thankful for uh, Representative Curtis and Maltons uh, spearheading the uh, HR 4081, the Informing Consumers About Smart Devices Act. Uh, this bill will require companies that manufacture devices with cameras and microphones not already uh, prominently made aware uh, to consumers, uh, they must disclose such features. The manufacturers uh, must disclose such features to consumers. Uh, and I think that's so very important. I'm also eager to advance my bill, H.R. 4551, the reporting attacks from nations selected for oversight and monitoring web attacks and ransomware from uh, enemies attacked, uh, act otherwise known as it's called the uh, Ransomware Act. That's what the bill's called. This legislation amends the U.S. Safe Web Act, a tool the FTC uses to protect consumers with international dimension, uh, including, uh, by, uh, including by increasing cooper cooperation with foreign law en enforcement and, uh, and will require the FTC to report on cross-border complaints they receive involving ransomware or other cybersecurity related incidents uh, committed by our adversaries, China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran, just to name a few. This legislation is very timely. Uh, and uh, in a few weeks, uh, just in a few weeks, a few weeks ago you saw the U.S. learned that uh, the Chinese government hackers had breached major telecommunication companies and network service providers to steal credentials and harvest data. Uh, what the CCP will do with their, this information, no one really knows, but if their intent is to ransom off the information or use it to extort Americans, this bill will help us better understand these attacks and learn how to better combat them. So I'm hopeful my colleagues will work with me to move this bill across the finish line. So very important. We had an attack uh, in our district last year uh, in one of my uh, cities. So certainly not uh, to our surprise, uh, this is not the only avenue the CCP uh, travels to get their hands on Americans' information. Last week we learned TikTok has been lying to Congress over the information they share with the Chinese Communist Party, specifically uh, the data belonging to Americans. This is completely unacceptable. TikTok's blatant lies are even more proof for why the American people and businesses deserve clear privacy and data security rules. We need to give consistent rules of the road that give the American people more control over their own data and provide businesses with clear obligations that don't change based on location of their store. We must also be particularly clear when it comes to protecting the data security and privacy of our children and teens. That's why I'm glad to see our bipartisan privacy bill, the H.R. 8152, the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, included on the docket today. We've taken a, and a lot of, uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback from stakeholders and have made significant progress to better clarify and improve the bill since our draft was initially released. I'm very thankful for all the constructive comments we received uh, up to this point. And I want to be clear, 
This is certainly not the last opportunity to work with us and continue to deliberate uh, on tweaking this bill. We will, and, uh, and again, uh, please don't hesitate to contact my office as well. There's still more work to be done, folks, but we must take this important step forward, and I look forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle and with our friends in the Senate to get this done. This is the best shot we've had in years to give the American people and businesses something they desperately need. Again, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for your cooperation, uh, and I appreciate it. Look forward to getting these bills out of committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bilirakis. And now I recognize Mr. Pallone, Chairman of the Full Committee, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Schakowsky. We're here today to consider vitally important consumer protective le legislation, and I'm proud that the first bill we'll be marking up is H.R. 8152, the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, which I introduced with the Ranking Member Rogers and Subcommittee Chair Schakowsky and Subcommittee Ranking Member Bill Arrakis. And this bill is the culmination of years of hard work by many members on this committee, and I want to thank them all for their roles in, in getting us here today. But as was discussed at the legislative hearing on a discussion draft of the bill earlier this month, this bill is the first serious, comprehensive national privacy legislation with bipartisan, bicameral support from the leaders of the House and the Senate committees of jurisdiction. And today's markup is another milestone towards our ultimate goal of enacting meaningful national privacy legislation. Now, every American knows that it's long past time for Congress to protect their data privacy and security. The modern world demands it. This legislation meets the moment with essential compromises that protect consumers while ensuring American businesses remain innovative and globally competitive. There's nothing abstract about the right to privacy and data security. This bill would protect our children and teens more than ever before. Companies, including social media platforms, will be flatly prohibited from targeting kids with harmful advertising. This advertising has been shown to increase rates of eating disorders, suicide, and other mental health issues, particularly among young women and girls. Companies will be required under the bill to get affirmative express consent before transferring any data related to people under the age of 17. And the new Youth Privacy and Marketing Division at the Federal Trade Commission will have the sole mission of protecting young people and will be staffed with experts in youth development. The American Data Privacy and Protection Act would also help protect vulnerable women in abusive relationships by giving them control over their personal information, limiting the data available for their aggressors to exploit, and regulating shady data brokers that too often provide the means to abuse the most vulnerable. And the bill would ensure that people of color are not discriminated against in trying to find housing, apply for a loan, look for a job, or being offered any goods and services. Privacy rights are civil rights. We must stop discriminatory uses of data so that people are not unfairly punished for who they are. And this bill helps prevent algorithmic bias from infecting the digital world and extends civil rights protections to the online world. Now, the version of the bill we consider today contains numerous changes from the initial discussion draft. This ongoing work demonstrates that we continue to fine-tune the legislation and find solutions to problems that have troubled many earlier privacy efforts. I look forward to continuing to improve the bill as it moves through the legislative process. But two issues in particular have long posed difficulties. First, the question of how national privacy legislation relates to existing laws, and second, the rights of individuals to access the courts. The bill today generally takes the same approach as the discussion draft. We're continuing to refine these provisions through productive discussions and have made tremendous progress, and I believe we're close to carving out the necessary solutions. But there's no time to wait on protecting American privacy and data security and providing certainty to American businesses. With this legislation, we are finally close to turning longstanding promises into reality. The status quo is untenable, and I'm optimistic that we'll continue working together to get this done for the American people. Finally, I, I would be remiss if I did not discuss the other important bipartisan bills before us today. We'll be marking up bills that protect horses from the terrible practice of soaring and from being slaughtered for human consumption. We'll also mark up Reese's Law to protect children from ingesting button cell and coin batteries. We'll also consider bills that would make sure internet-connected devices tell people before they record them, standardized remote online notarization, 
and establish a primary online location for information on federal manufacturing programs. So I look forward to the discussion on all of these important bills. I do, have, I, I do want to say that, you know, uh, not only uh, uh, um, Ms. Schakowsky, but um, Mrs. Rogers and also um, uh, the, the, the ranking member, Mr. Bilirakis, uh, have really worked hard um, in the last two years on a number of consumer bills. And the fact that we can do these bipartisan consumer bills is very significant. I always worry, I, I remember the days when consumerism on this committee was like golden and everybody wanted to have a consumer bill. But it seemed like that kind of died out over the last 10, 20 years. And I, I really think we've kind of revived it. So I do want to thank the leadership on the committee for paying a lot of attention to consumerism in a way that maybe hasn't necessarily been the case uh, in the last uh, two decades. I hate to say it, but I think that this is, a, you know, it's back on the, it's back uh, in the front line again. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Chairman uh, Pallone. And now I recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mrs. Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Last week, we held our first legislative hearing on the bipartisan, bicameral American Data Privacy and Protection Act. I'm pleased to say that we have officially introduced this legislation as the next step in this process of plowing the hard ground necessary to legislate for a national standard. I want to thank Chairman Pallone, Subcommittee Chairwoman Sherkowski, Republican Subcommittee Leader Gus Bilirakis, and all that have been involved in getting us to this point. I'd also like to thank our Senate colleague, Senator Wicker, for his bicameral support. There's no better time than now to enact comprehensive privacy and data security protections. According to a recent Morning Consult political survey, Politico, yeah, survey, more than 80% of Americans support the key pillars of our legislation, their support for a national framework enacted by Congress is overwhelming and bipartisan. Now it's time for us to do our job. Our framework is the best opportunity we've had in decades for a national data privacy standard. It's a culmination of years of effort with policies that have been public and received comment over that time. And it will put people in charge of their own data. We've received constructive feedback from stakeholders and colleagues. Those that have participated have already improved the bill. And, and as we move this bill through the process, we'll continue to welcome and encourage that input. It's the key purpose of moving legislation through regular order, leading to better outcomes and stronger solutions. As we continue our process, we must remain focused on creating the best standard possible to protect people's privacy promote innovation and entrepreneurship, and ensure American leadership. First and foremost, Americans need one national standard, not a patchwork of state laws. This bill protects all Americans, regardless of zip code, and provides certainty for businesses so that they clearly understand their obligations. We also need to target malicious data practices from the bad actors. Last week, it was reported that TikTok knowingly allowed the Chinese Communist Party to access American user data collected by the app. After telling Americans and Congress on numerous occasions that they do not share US da user data with the Chinese government, CCP, or any Chinese-owned state-owned en entities. This is unacceptable and a complete be betrayal of trust. People should know how their data is collected and shared, which is why we require companies to specify when they're transferring and storing people's data in countries like China, Russia, and Iran. Preventing real harms from bad actors is equally important for protecting our children and minors, especially from big tech, no matter where they live. Big tech can't target our kids. They can't exploit them. We have a privacy law. Our bill would foster stronger data security practices by requiring companies to only keep the information they need and encouraging them to take steps to better secure data that is retained. It also requires big tech to examine how their algorithms may harm individuals, including children. And while the bill places strict requirements on big tech companies, which can afford high compliance costs, it ensures small businesses and startups remain competitive. 
by equipping them with the resources to comply with their obligations and providing relief from burdensome compliance mechanisms. This allows them to unleash their full potential to better power America's economy. A comprehensive, forward-thinking national privacy standard will secure American global economic leadership and ensure that we win the future. We're also marking up several important bills, like uh, Reese's Law, led by Ms. Kelly to protect children. I want to thank Trista Hamsmith for her courage and leadership, making a difference for families across America. We're also examining the securing and enabling commerce using remote and le electronic Notarization Act of 2021, introduced by Mr. Armstrong with Ms. Dean and several other bipartisan co-sponsors. The Informing Consumers About Smart Devices Act, led by Mr. Curtis and Mr. Moulton, requiring smart devices like TVs disclosed to consumers when devices include a microphone or camera. The Ransomware Act from Mr. Bill Arrakis will promote our economic and online data security by requiring the FTC to report on ransomware attacks from Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. And additionally, Mr. Tonko has a bill, the Manufacturing.gov Act, with reps Upton and Axney, to help streamline access to information about federal manufacturing programs, as I know there's more on this committee that we can do to encourage investment in American companies. I look forward to discussing these bills today. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you so much to um, Mrs. Rogers, um, and uh, and I uh, want to ask if any other members seek to um, uh, seek right now to make an opening statement. Oh, Ms. Gaston, you are uh, acknowledged. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. You know, every American should expect that their personal privacy is being protected. Uh, so I am so pleased to see this subcommittee mark up a bipartisan, bicameral, National Comprehensive Privacy and Data Security Bill that, that will provide the American people with strong protections across their digital devices and services and products uh, and help hold those that act in bad faith accountable. And I'm especially glad to see the protections for children in this bill, including important provisions from my bills, the Kids Privacy Act and the Kids Act, uh, because we are at a watershed moment when it comes to protecting children's online privacy, safety, and health. As evidence on the ways in which children and teens are being harmed from online interactions uh, is increasingly evident, including a great deal of testimony that we received here in the committee, enormous amounts of research that have uh, that's evolved over the, the past couple of years, and a lot of newspaper and media exposés. For example, 25% of 9 to 17-year-olds report have, having had an online sexually explicit interaction with someone they believe to be an adult. A research paper in the Journal of Public Health Policy found that youth exposure to alcohol marketing has been linked to increased alcohol consumption and problems. An abundance of research has found correlations between social media use by youth and depressive symptoms, decreased self-esteem, general and physical appearance anxiety, and body dissatisfaction. Some of the big tech companies have gotten caught for violating the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, but it's clear they'll pay the fines and see it just as the cost of doing business. So I appreciate the work that this committee has undertaken with my team to incorporate even stronger protections for children online, uh, especially since our legislative hearing last week. Uh, I continue to hear from parents, uh, students themselves, advocates that we need to take aggressive action to protect kids online. And towards this end, I believe it's important that we ensure the companies are doing everything they can to mitigate risks that young users may face. I also believe it's important that we do everything we can to ensure that when companies are designing and developing products, they put the best interest of children first. Uh, so I look forward to working with uh, the committee on creating these robust protections in either this bill or uh, in legislation to come. And I want to truly thank Chairman Pallone and Ranking Member McMorris Rogers, Chairwoman Schakowsky, and Ranking Mem Member Bill Arrakis and the professional staff for working to improve the bill. Thank you, and I yield back.
The gentlewoman uh, yields back. I want to thank her for her leadership on protecting children, which we saw at last week's hearing is a priority for many of, uh, of us, probably all of us on this committee. Um, and let me ask now if there are other people who would like to make uh, an opening statement at this time. Um, Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark, you are recognized. I thank you, Chairwoman Chikowski, Ranking Member Bill Arrakis, uh, Rep Congressman uh, Pallone, and, and Ranking Member McMorris Rogers for introducing uh, these crucial pieces of legislation. It is more important than ever that we get comprehensive data mm -hmm. privacy legislation right. And as such, I'm pleased to see the scope of algorithmic impact assessments in the amendment in the nature of a substitute includes more provisions from my Algorithmic Accountability Act of 2022 that provide concrete guidance on what information covered entities need to provide in Congress with respect to their impact assessments. As local, state, and federal agencies are increasingly turning to algorithmic systems to screen and determine benefits el eligibility, I urge my colleagues to keep in mind the risk we run by excluding large data holders from the list of covered entities who provide data services to government agencies. Private companies providing data services and platforms to government agencies may view this exemption as adequate justification to obtain personal data to fuel algorithmic decision making that can have major impacts on people's private lives. A loophole like this could lead to increased surveillance of already vulnerable individuals. Today I will vote yes, and I look forward to continued discussions on this issue to make certain we provide data privacy protections for the most vulnerable. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. Is there anyone else who would like to make an opening statement at this time? Mr. Soto. Okay, Mr. Soto, you recognize. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm very excited today to finally be putting together a Internet Privacy uh, Bill of Rights. Uh, it's something that uh, in Florida, while we have a right to privacy in the Constitution, uh, it's vague uh, and doesn't actually provide a framework. So there's no actual state internet privacy laws uh, in Florida. And uh, very excited also that this is bipartisan. Uh, and the bill contains some key issues that I'm, I know many Floridians are gonna be asking about, like a duty of loyalty. Making sure companies can only collect, process, and transfer data that's reasonably necessary and proportionate uh, to the services provided. It has to be related to what business you're conducting with um, that particular company. It gives all Americans the right to their own data. Uh, how often have we seen folks see their data flow throughout the internet and they can't get access to it? It gives all Americans the right to opt out of, of targeted ads when they don't want them. And additional key protections for children under 17 years of age. Uh, when you look at uh, the sensitive covered data, it reads like a, a bill of rights itself making sure to keep private people's social security numbers, passport numbers, driver's license information, physical and mental health, uh, financial account information, uh, biometric information, genetic information, precise geo geolocation information, where we literally are, our private communications like voicemails and emails, account logins, uh, your sexual orientation, uh, calendar information, address books, phones, text logs, private photos, uh, information about uh, video content from your service provider for cable and broadcast. Uh, all these things, people would be outraged uh, if they were freely uh, sent across the internet uh, without a right uh, for people to be able to uh, protect them. Um, I'm proud and excited to be able to vote for this bill today. I know there'll be uh, some tightening we may have to do on uh, some of the first party language <clears throat> with regard to uh, ad content to make sure Folks who have existing relationships, direct relationships with consumers can continue to advertise their information uh, and obviously segment that, segmenting that away from third party. Uh, I also, uh, Madam Chair, have a letter from AAJ that uh, I wanted to introduce to the record at some point, whether now or uh, uh, at a future time uh, to be able to discuss some future concerns as we go forward. Without objection. Thank you. So and I yield back.
there anyone else who would like to make an opening statement? And that concludes our opening statements. Um, but pursuant to committee rules, members will um, have the opportunity per, to offer written opening statements, and they shall be made uh, part of the record. Um, please submit written uh, opening statements to the email address that, uh, that we have provided. And at this point, now we can uh, begin, and the uh, the chair calls up HR 8153, the American Data Privacy and Protection Act. The clerk will report the title of the bill. I'm sorry. Did I say that number? 8152. Sorry. Yes. H.R. 8152, a bill to provide consumers with foundational data privacy rights, create strong oversight mechanisms, and establish meaningful enforcement. Be it enacted by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America and Congress assembled. Without objection, the uh, first reading of the bill will be dispensed with. The bill is now open for um, uh, consideration as read. Um, and without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendments at, uh, at, at any point. Now, are there, uh, are there uh, members um, who are seeking recognition to speak on H.R. 8152? And uh, the chair would like to recognize herself um, to strike the last word. So this is a this is a, a fantastic uh, moment of opportunity. Um, after many years and much work from this subcommittee, um, really years of of work, we're finally at the point that we are going to be able to move forward. Um, the bipartisan bicameral American Data Privacy and Protection Act will provide relief to consumers who feel helpless online many times. Um, so I wanted to just uh, reiterate some things that I mentioned last time, which is the kinds of things that are happen uh, that will happen on day one when this bill would become law. Companies will have a duty to only collect the minimum amount of data that is necessary to operate. Consumers will have the right to access, correct, delete and transfer their, their data. Consumers will be able to reject sharing their information with third parties. Consumers won't be forced to uh, kind of take it or leave it uh, or uh, pay for privacy um, to get what they, what they want and what they need. Um, we will create protection for children, as we heard from Congresswoman Castor, under 17 years old, raising that age from 13. Um, they cannot target um, children with, uh, with personalized ads. Um, many, uh, they may not uh, uh, be, be forced into arbitration when it comes to children, um, cannot share the data with third parties without prior consent, um, can sue companies for violating their, their rights. I also wanted to call attention to the process that we had, which I think has really contributed to our being here today. Um, and I wanna thank the staff who worked so hard on bringing all the, sta the stakeholders together. We had six privacy uh, roundtables bringing together these stakeholders and small groups so that they could look at each other face to face across the table from different sectors to anticipate and then work out some of the problems that, uh, that, that might have, have happened. Um, I also um, just want to say, look, um, I don't want to take too much time going over the, uh, the legislation, but it really does have very strong enforcement mechanisms and hold uh, companies uh, accountable. It is time to end the, the promises 
that uh, big tech ha has made to us, the excuses they have made to us, and now um, we will be able to streamline rulemaking. Um, we will have first violation civil penalties. We will make consumers um, whole and uh, uh, jurisdiction and, and um, have uh, jurisdiction over common carriers. Um, this bill is not is not perfect yet though it's well on its, on its way, but I wanna make sure that we have the philosophy going forward that we're not going to let the perfect be the enemy of the good, and we are gonna work diligently over the next short time, I hope, to make a bill that is going to not only um, be passed by the House of Representatives, but also by the Senate, and signed into law by the President of the United States. It is time, consumers are asking for this, and it is absolutely time to fill that obligation to help consumers and deliver on this legislation. So I wanna thank you for the good start that, uh, that, that we've made. Um, I yield back, but are there others who seek recognition at this time? Mr. Bilouakis. Thank you, Madam Chair, I appreciate it. I move to strike the last word. Uh, this marks a milestone day for our subcommittee as we are able to continue to move the process forward on comprehensive privacy and data security legislation in a bipartisan fashion with the advancement of the American Data Privacy and Protection Act. I want to thank the chair uh, and, of course, uh, you know, I, I want to thank the full uh, members of the committee, but also the chairman of the full committee as well as the ranking member. and. Uh, this amendment in the nature of a substitute continues the negotiations we've agreed on thus far. And I believe, Madam Chair, are we on the amendment in the nature of a substitute, the Ains? Not yet, after okay. your... Um, All right, so okay. let me go ahead and, and give my, my spill and I won't speak on the Ains. Uh, I'm pleased that since our legislative hearing on our discussion draft bill, we have been able to take that feedback and make some significant improvements that move the bill in the right direction. For example, I'm glad to see additional protections for small businesses in this bill. As I noted in our legislative hearing, we know local mom and pop stores and startups that want to do the right thing don't always have the resources or the time to be able to understand their obligations, which is why we provide exemptions from certain requirements, as well as uh, opportunity to educate those entities on best practices to come into compliance. I know we must be sensitive to these small companies and ensure they not only remain innovators, but can continue to do their business for consumers and the benefit of our economy. So I'm looking forward to continually, again, working on this uh, with them to make sure they will not be unduly burdened. Uh, I'm also glad to see that the AINS uh, provides, and we'll introduce that, uh, provides additional protections for company loyalty programs. I know these are important for both consumers and companies. After all, who doesn't love a free coffee, uh, cup of coffee on their birthday? Further, I believe we, we have made good progress with regard to independent measurements uh, of content and advertisements online, and clarity regarding the role of service providers and their additional obligations to assist and provide technical data security safeguards. The AINS uh, also makes clarifications to ensure we are preempting FCC communication services to provide further consistency across the spectrum. Needless to say, we have come a long way in fine-tuning the bill thus far, but we have a lot of work to do too. So while we have made great progress, as I said, I do not know, uh, I do know that there is still some further tweaks that we need to make to this bill, and I'm optimistic that we will get it right. As, uh, as I said before, we need to be constructive and collaborative here, uh, and I appreciate um, our members willing to engage with thoughtful feedback to improve the bill further, and for, for those in the industry who have sought to work with us to get this legislation right, I know the job isn't done yet. We have. Uh, we have heard from industry, 
and I'm certainly sympathetic to concerns from them and from my colleagues about providing too much leeway for frivolous lawsuits or not ensuring a national standard across preempting state privacy and data security laws, but also I want to reiterate the tireless negotiations that have gone into these sections in particular to get it to where we are today. We've made tremendous progress with more to come, and I invite members um, and all, everyone to come to my office and give their input. I know it hasn't been easy, and I'll, I know we'll continue to uh, try to do the right thing uh, by our uh, constituents, of course. Uh, to close, I urge support of this AINS when it will be called up, and I hope we can continue to work to, towards getting this right. And I want to thank the staff for doing a, an outstanding work on both sides of the aisle thus far. Thank you, and I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Bilirakis. And at this point, I will now recognize uh, Mr. Pallone to offer the um, AINS uh, the, uh, amendment in the nature of a substitute. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment in the nature of a substitute at the desk. It's labeled privacy underscore ANGS underscore 01. Let, let me ask the, the, the clerk will report the uh, amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 8152 offered by Mr. Pallone of New Jersey. Strike all after the enacting clause and insert the following. Section 1, short title, table of contents. Short title. Without, this act without objection, the reading of the amendment will be um, dispensed with. Um, so proceed, Mr. Pallone. Thank you, Madam Chair. Enacting bipartisan national privacy legislation has evaded Congress because it's difficult. The deliberative process is the only way we're ultimately going to get there. And this aims and the underlying bill mark a massive step forward. There are more automatic protections for consumers in the AINS. There are clear processes for getting out of targeted advertising online. There are strong protections for kids, and the draft's overall structure was, was reformed to make it easier to enforce the law. And I'm talking now about the underlying bill. As you know, the, the private right of action and preemption provisions have been the most difficult points of negotiation on privacy legislation for the last decade. In this case, the negotiators made substantial progress before the subcommittee, but even still, we needed more time to finalize the language. So that's why we have not yet made changes to sections 403 on enforcement by persons and 404 on preemption, which is especially important for the states that already have a strong privacy law. So I'm trying to make a distinction here. The, the sections 403 and 404 of the AINS are identical to the June 3rd discussion draft with the exception of one provision that clarifies that certain parts of the Communications Act of 1934 do not apply to covered entities under the bill. So we're gonna to continue to work on these sections and hope to reach a consensus on the language uh, soon. And in the meantime, I'm proud of the changes that are contained in the bill and the AINS, and I would encourage their passage. I, I just wanna to stress to everyone, um, we have a, a, the discussion draft was the subject of the, of the hearing, you know, it really was excellent. But we are going to continue to make changes. And so this AINS reflects continued efforts to make changes, always bipartisan, always with the idea of consensus in mind. And with that, I yield back, Madam Chair. The, uh, the gentleman yields back. Are there other members seeking to um, be recognized to speak on the AINS, the uh, amendment? Yes. Uh, I, I now recognize um, Congresswoman Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to strike the last word. Thank you. I want to thank chair, the Chairman again, Chairman Frank Pallone, for working together as a full partner on this, along with Chair Schakowsky and Ranking Member Bill Arrakis. I support the AINS as it reflects the bipartisan agreement we made for the bill introduction. We all know there is more work to be done on this bill that was introduced. But the process we are in the middle of to continually improve this bill shows the great power of this committee to deliberate and reach consensus. I want to thank Senator Wicker as well for his cooperation in moving this bill forward. I look forward to continuing our efforts to get Republicans and Democrats in the House and the Senate united in enacting this landmark legislation. Thank you, and I yield back.
Ms. Chahan, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I move to strike the last word. The legislation before us today represents historic protections for consumers, historic and necessary. And I'm grateful to you, Madam Chair, Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Bill Rockus, Ranking Member McMorris Rogers, and the professional staff here on committee for your work on this massive effort. Today, we can hardly do anything without having our personal data shared so corporations can target ads and manipulate us into spending more time on a screen. Whether it's a favorable, mo uh, favorite mobile game, tracking our heart rate on a smartwatch, getting in a connected vehicle, scrolling through social media to keep up with friends and family, or just about anything else, every action we take is being tracked, recorded, and shared. The American D Data Privacy and Protection Act introduces many key proposals that finally begin to address these core concerns. The transparency requirements in this bipartisan bill mean users will finally stand a chance to understand what sensitive data companies collect. The provisions related to data brokers mean consumers will finally not have to worry about the endless sale of their data. They'll finally have more options to unsubscribe, and I'm particularly pleased that large data holders will finally have to complete algorithm, algorithm impact assessments. Like many on this committee, I've been advocating for many of these priorities over the past year and a half, and I recognize many of my colleagues have spent several years working toward this proposal. However, the stakes couldn't be higher right now. We're seeing widespread abuses across digital platforms that are taking place largely because federal enforcers in Congress have been unable to keep up. It's critical that we get this right. And while I plan to vote yes for today on this bipartisan package, I ask that we continue working together so that the final product is something that will improve the lives of the hardworking families we represent while also promoting the innovation that has become stifled by tech giants over the last decade. Specifically, I would like to collaborate with you, Madam Chair, and Ranking Member Balrakis on better protections for our children. I know my colleagues on both sides of the aisle care deeply about this issue. We should be covering ed tech vendors that are currently free from enforcement under FERPA. And we can make sure that students at both public and private schools have similar data rights. We should ensure that key protections in the age-appropriate design code, things like commitments to act in the best interest of the child and the age-appropriate application of the act's other provisions are clearly covered by the youth division or listed as an area where states can act with their own proposals. And we can make long overdue bipartisan progress in ensuring the best and brightest in our nation can continue to do research in the public interest. Whether that's R&D for artificial intelligence, connected vehicle safety, or the issue, issue many of you have heard me speak to in my advocacy for the Social Media Data Act, ensuring that researchers can study content moderation processes and recommender systems. Many on this committee have applauded Frances Haugen's bravery and courage. Let's take the next step and implement some of the solutions that she called for, starting with enabling independent research or social media platforms which is critical for responsible policy making and understanding how to protect people online. We have a tremendous opportunity before us with this bipartisan, bicameral agreement, and it's one that people across the United States can't afford for us to miss. As consumers' physical lives continue to blur more, more and more with their digital lives, it's imperative that we get this right. I look forward to voting yes today and continuing to work with you, Madam Chair, Ranking Member Bill Rockus, and my colleagues on the committee to make sure the end product is something that we're all proud of. Thank you. I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. And uh, where am I? I see Mr. Upton. Uh, you are like strike, strike the last word. I, I want to thank Chairman Pallone and my leader Rogers for bringing a bipartisan bill to the subcommittee. Seems like internet privacy and data security issues have been around forever and a day. There are probably only a couple of us on the committee who were here when it wasn't an issue. The full house actually passed data security legislation not once but twice over a decade ago on a bipartisan basis. And I had to grab, grapple with the privacy and security for my six years as full committee chair also. I would hope that all of us, after all this time, can work together to get the issues right. I've got a number of issues that I would like to see addressed before we get to full committee. Uh, section 104, and 
Uh, I hope to work with the chair and ranking member to clarify Section 104 to preserve customer loyalty programs, which are a critical and ever-growing facet of the restaurant business model. And we heard that in the testimony uh, last week, I guess it was. If Section 104 isn't changed, businesses are going to face the possibility of having to eliminate their loyalty programs so the customers can continue enjoying the discounts and other benefits that already opt in to enjoy today. Customers shouldn't be discriminated against for choosing to exercise one of their privacy rights outlined within the bill, but the legislation as drafted would inhibit the ability of customers and businesses to voluntarily establish mutually beneficial business customer relationships and set the terms of those relationships. I believe that we ought to work together to align the Data Protection Act loyalty program language with the state data privacy laws enacted in Virginia, Colorado, Utah, and Connecticut to provide more certainty for businesses and customers alike so that the loyalty programs will be protected. And I've said, Section 302, services provider and third-party obligations. I also want to work with the chair and my ranking member, my leader, to strengthen Section 302 of the bill outlining service provider and third-party obligations so that no consumers are left unprotected when their personal data is handled by any business regardless of where they live. Main Street businesses shouldn't be held liable for potential privacy violations committed by their downstream business partners acting as a service provider or third party. While the legislation contains some of these obligations, the bill as drafted currently would allow contracts to dictate these terms which would leave small businesses particularly holding the bag, given the lack of their market power. And I, would, I would believe that we should look to other data privacy bills that have been introduced over the last couple of years, again in Virginia, Colorado, Utah, and Connecticut, to ensure that all players within the digital ecosystem have statutory requirements that best protect consumers across the country. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Ms. Castor, you are recognized. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I move to strike the last word. Um, thank you for being open to improving the legislation as we move forward uh, today. The, we all know that the last decade has seen a revolution in the amount of time that children spend online with detrimental consequences for our kids, their mental and physical health. Research from 2019 found that preschool children were averaging two and a half hours of screen time per day, while preteens averaged almost five hours per day and teens almost 7.5 hours to, per day. And the pandemic supercharged these trends. Uh, screen time for ch children is estimated to have increased by 50% during the pandemic, and 35% of parents report that their children began using social media during the pandemic at a younger age than their parents had originally planned. So we as legislators need to honestly reckon with the harms to children and teens that are arising as a result and give parents a greater ability to protect their kids online. The, the examples, unfortunately, abound from 19-year-old Alexis Spence, who was able to create her first Instagram account at the age of 11, at 11 without her parents' knowledge, and in violation of the platform's minimum age requirement of 13. We know Instagram, Facebook foster addictive usage. Alexis said that has led to an eating disorder, self-harm, thoughts of suicide, and thanks to Frances Haugen, we know that Instagram is well aware of the, that its platform is linked to worsening body image and mental health issues among teen girls in particular. So Julia Anderson, who at age 16 posted sexualized videos on TikTok because she learned that if you post stuff showing your body, people will start liking it, and, and Joshua, uh, Haliasis, a 12-year-old from Colorado who passed away after attempting the blackout challenge on TikTok, which encourages young people to hold their breath until they pass out. These are unacceptable tragedies that are motivating uh, legislators, regulators across the world to require these companies to be more proactive when, and build safeguards for children into their products and then penalize them if they do, do not do so. These harms are arising because of inadequate pr data privacy and security safeguards. But I, I believe that, that our bill uh, 
including its data minimization regime and loyalty duties will help limit the types of data on children and teens and the types of harms that result. But I think we can do better. Uh, look to some of the uh, legislation that is out there uh, from a lot of our colleagues. In My Kids Act, uh, Senator Markey's work, Senator Blackburn, uh, two ENC uh, uh, members who went over to the Senate, look to the UK design code. We've got to, I think it would be helpful to give the FTC greater direction on the design. This means regulating, addressing autoplay uh, that's built into, that leads to prolonged unhealthy viewing, maybe push alerts that encourage kids and young teens to pull out their devices uh, when maybe they're trying to study or do something else addressing websites and algorithms and apps that amplify violent and inappropriate, dangerous content to kids. So I hope Chairwoman Schakowsky and Ranking Member Bilirakis and colleagues, we can all work together uh, to continue to work to ensure that these were in, this is our opportunity really to ensure that online apps are truly appropriate for kids and teens. Uh, I trust that everyone wants to do the best for our kids, and I yield back. Gentlewoman, gentlewoman excuse me, the gentlewoman yields back. Uh, Mr. Bouchon, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to strike the last word. I'm, I'm glad that this subcommittee is continuing with an open and deliberative process in considering the American Data Privacy and Protection Act. Looking at the differences between the draft legislation discussed last week and the aims before us today, I see some marked improvements. For example, the increased thresholds for who will be classified as small business under the bill will help ensure that they are protected and provided with the flexibilities they need. I am confident that this same level of consideration and thoughtfulness will remain as we move forward. There are certainly some things we should further examine, whether we need to clarify language on customer loyalty programs, for example, which rely on third-party data to provide services to consumers. We also may need to take another look about how, about how the legislation interacts with the existing laws governing health and scientific data. The current bill draft provides an exemption for data covered under HIPAA, which I appreciate, but HIPAA itself is more limited than many people realize. I wonder whether there are additional exemptions we should consider to ensure this does not interfere with FDA and industry's ability to use personal scientific data in their research studies. Ultimately, I am supportive of giving consumers more power to control, keep private, and even delete their data. But we must carefully evaluate the language we use to avoid unintended consequences. Again, I appreciate everyone's dedication to moving this bill to regular order, and I encourage this committee to keep making progress on this critical piece of legislation. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Um, having... Um not heard of anyone on the Democratic side who seeks recognition now. Let me recognize Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to strike the last word. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to continue this discussion about the importance of enacting a bipartisan federal data privacy and security bill, but this is a complex project. Congress must remain committed to getting this right. That means we must continue to follow regular order and include industry in the conversation. We want real privacy protections and consumer confidence. During last week's hearing, I spoke about the urgency of forcing big tech companies to be transparent with the Americans about whether they're transferring, storing, or accessing their personal data in countries that we simply cannot trust, like China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. I'm pleased that the bill before us today includes this language. The New York Times published an article this week which is highlighting China's goal to collect personal data to control and influence individual Americans. I look forward to making progress with my colleagues in the committee to ensure American sensitive data is not used to extend our adversaries' influence and make the world a less safe place. And also, I'd like to associate myself with the remarks of Dr. Bouchon and several of my colleagues um, regarding the healthcare industry. While this legislation includes 
sector protections for health laws, I urge all members of the committee to carefully analyze the bill's language to make sure it is clear in its intent. Private sector driven R&D relies heavily on research data that is already subject to existing standards that do a good job of protecting Americans. Let's make sure that the U.S. remains an attractive place for the healthcare industry. Thank you, Madam Chair, for having this hearing, and I yield back. Is there anyone seeking recognition on the Ames? Yes, Madam Chair. Where? Right here. Debbie, let's go. You have an amendment, right? I do. Okay. So um, we're, um, if, there, if there's no more comments now seeking recognition on the, uh, on the Ains, we um, will move to, um, uh, I will recognize those who want to offer an amendment um, to the, in, in the nature of a substitute. And Ms. Lesko, you are recognized, but first let me um, ask the clerk to report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 8152 offered by Mrs. Lesko of Arizona. Page 67, line 19, insert political viewpoint after Without religion. objection, the reading of the amendment uh, will be dispensed with. And now the chair recognizes Ms. Lesko for her amendment. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Um, big tech discriminating against political viewpoints is something many of my constituents bring up to me quite often. Um, that is why I'm offering an amendment related to algorithmic assessments. I believe political bias does exist. Um, I'll read you some examples. Earlier this year, researchers from North Carolina State University found that Nearly 70% of emails from um, Republican candidates were sent to spam email boxes by Google compared to less than one in 10 from Democrat candidates from 2019 to 2020. And the opposite was true with Outlook and Yahoo. Uh, more of the Democrat candidates were sent to spam than Republican candidates. And uh, the study was quite thorough to make sure that it was based on political viewpoints instead of other factors. Um, also, uh, there's a fairly famous example, a Google search result listed Nazism as an official ideology of the California GOP. And then on Friday, um, as you are aware, um, several uh, Democratic senators and Congress members wrote to Google's parent company on this last Friday, June 17th, to pressure the search engine to suppress results that offer alternatives uh, to abortion. And um, that's why I think this amendment is, is needed. Uh, and it's unfortunate that it's needed, but I believe that it is needed. Uh, but with that being said, if the chair would uh, meet with me or talk to me or work with me between now and the full committee markup to um, talk about my concerns and address my concerns, I will I'll withdraw the amendment and not ask for a vote today. Well, I'm great, grateful for that offer and happy to take you up on that to, to work with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the, the gentle lady withdraws her amendment. Um, I. Don't see any um, offers for amendment on the Democratic side. I understand that Mr. Armstrong, excuse me? Oh, oh Mr. Guthrie arrived. Oh, okay. Um, Mr. Guthrie arrived to uh, strike the last word. You are recognized, Mr. Guthrie. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. I appreciate that very much. Um, and thanks for uh, the, the, con the comments earlier about how we know we have a lot of work to do in getting some of the definitions correct. Um, it's, it's been brought to my attention there's some potential issues with biomedical research. I know that in innovation in the United States, I know that, that we don't want this uh, bill to, to do, do that. And, and what's been brought to my attention is currently written, this, this legislation would apply the same requirements of biomedical research data as it would to all other forms of personal data. And providing access to, um, and providing access to requiring the deletion of and control of personal data to each individual we create an obligation on researchers that conflicts with existing legal and ethical obligations to maintain records 
submit certain data to regulatory agencies and ensure that certain trials are appropriately blinded to protect their scientific validity in the case of the FDA re regulated double blinded trials. Um, biomedical research, whether in a clinical or real world practice setting, is subject to ethical and scientific standards that include safeguards for individuals' decision making process. And I know that we can work together to address these concerns to ensure biomedical research is not impacted in a negative way and patients can continue to receive access to life saving therapies. I thank you for the attitude for all of us to work together. I look forward to doing so, and I will yield back. The gentleman um, yields back. I know that Mr. Um, Armstrong has an amendment, and the clerk can read the amendment. Mr. Armstrong, what is the name of your amendment? Uh, zero on Armstrong. Hold on. 31. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 8152 offered by Mr. Armstrong of North Dakota. Page 115, strike like 18, and all that follows through page 119, line 9, and insert without, the following. Without objection, the first reading of the bill uh, will be dispensed with. The bill will now be considered as read, and Mr. Armstrong, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Express preemption of state laws has been a fundamental Republican negotiating point in our privacy Does discussions. Matter, right? We are all familiar with the compliance challenges and extensive costs that was, will result, would result in a patchwork of national and state privacy laws were in effect. During the subcommittee's hearing last week, I raised issues with the form of the preemption, preemption provision addressing preemption of state laws. I remain concerned that the bill's state preemption section is likely to withstand, unlikely to withstand legal challenges to its intended preemptive effect. There's a real possibility that courts interpret the numerous exemptions of specific and general state laws to mean that there is, in fact, zero preemption of state law. Since 1947, the Supreme Court has held that preemption of state law will not be recognized unless it is clear and manifest purpose of Congress to preempt state laws and federal act. When a federal statute contains an express preemption provision, like the one contained in my amendment, the courts will simply look to plain meaning of the text to discern Congress's intended scope of preemption. However, when Congress's intended scope is not clear, courts will conduct a conflict analysis to determine if a state law actually conflicts with the federal act. And that is what I fear we have with H.R. 8152, a complex set of exemptions of both specific and general state laws that fails the Supreme Court's test of a clear and manifest purpose of Congress to preempt. Under the implied preemption analysis, the court's mission is to preserve state laws if possible. Because of its heavy use of carve-outs to express preemption clause, the bill's current preemption provision is highly unlikely to even preempt state privacy laws that the committee intends to preempt. When drafting these provisions, Congress must understand these important rules that the Supreme Court and federal courts have laid out. First, federal courts often view any included carve-out in a preemption clause as fatal to preemption language. This is because the mere existence of the carve-out calls into question the congressional intent behind the entire preemption clause. Second, the result is that courts have consistently used the presence of state law carve-outs to justify the use of an implied preemption analysis in these cases. That type of analysis permits the courts to preserve any state laws with a purpose that is consistent with the federal act's purpose so long as there is no actual conflict. Meaning that if a covered entity could comply with both the state law and the federal act, it will be required to do both. To be clear, the bill's preemption language, which contains an entire paragraph devoted to state law carve-outs, is highly unlikely to prevent any state laws because federal courts have interpreted carve-outs as the signal that courts should preserve all related state laws. And that interpretation may not just preserve those specific state laws that are listed in the Federal Act, but all relevant state laws. The result would be exactly what Republicans <coughs> have opposed, a national privacy framework on top of numerous state privacy frameworks. The compliance and implementation costs would be significant and harmful to the economy. That is why we need to get the preemption language to correct. My amendment would provide a clear express preemption of all state laws regarding data privacy and security standards. The amendment closely adheres to the federal court precedent on preemption laws, and this specific language has been consistently upheld as the most reliable expression of congressional intent to ex ex expressly preempt state laws. 
And I know that preemption is going to continue to be a part of negotiation throughout this process. And regardless of where we end up on that negotiation, I think it's really important that the law does what we actually intend it to do. And so I'm going to withdraw the amendment because I think we need this to go forward. But we do, we need to see, I mean, we, we have a framework, but without proper and narrow enforcement, we, we, we're going to continue to move forward. So I thought it was important to raise, and with that, I yield back. The, the gentleman yields back, but are there other members seeking recognition to speak on the amendment? Ms. Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to strike the last word. I want to thank my colleague, Representative Armstrong, for raising these important issues. I appreciate his expertise and his background on issues of enforcement and preemption. He's been a leader on this subcommittee on government overreach and frivolous litigation, and your voice and input are needed on these matters, which is why I'm pleased that you've your, of your focus on these enforcement solutions in our Republican draft released last November. From the very beginning of this debate, creating a strong, preemptive national standard has been one of my top priorities, and that hasn't changed. There's tough trade-offs to build consensus in bipartisan legislation like the one that is before us. Those negotiations don't stop today, as this is not a finished product. I want to continue to focus on what Representative Armstrong has raised in between subcommittee and full committee consideration, along with other issues raised by our members that will make this a stronger bill. As I've said before, with continued member feedback and constructive input from the stakeholders, this product can grow into a landmark achievement. Thank you. I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. I want to note that Mr. Armstrong has uh, withdrawn his amendment. Um, but uh, I want to see, are there uh, any members who seek recognition to offer an amendment at this time? Madam Chair, I have another amendment at the desk. Mr. Armstrong, you are recognized. Number 32. The clerk will uh, read the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 8152, offered by Mr. Armstrong of North Dakota. Page 108, after line 21, insert the following and redesignate the succeeding paragraphs accordingly. Without, without objection, the uh, reading of the amendment will be dispensed with. Mr. Armstrong, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Section 403 of the bill provides for a private right of action. Among other provisions, a person or class of persons bringing a civil suit must notify the FTC and the Attorney General of the applicable state prior to commencing a civil action. The FTC and the State Attorney General then have 60 days to determine if they will proceed with an enforcement action based on that claim. This section prohibits a private litigant from any written communication requesting monetary payments that is sent to a covered entity before the 60-day review period or after the FTC or State Attorney General decide to pursue civil actions against the energy, an entity. The language is very specific. Any written communication requesting monetary payment. While that language may encompass demand letters, it does not prohibit a private litigant from bringing a civil action if the FTC or the State Attorney General also decides to pursue a civil action covering the same conduct. If that was the intent, the language would specifically prohibit the term civil action which is the specific term used in Section 403 to empower private litigants. So the bill is creating the possibility where a covered entity could be subject to an FTC or state civil action, in addition to a private civil action, all covering the same allegation. Simply put, the bill allows for concurrent litigation on enforcement actions. That results in a potential for conflicting outcomes on the same conduct. And to be clear, particularly with small business, the minute you end up in court and end up in litigation, you're already losing. The cost of compliance, the cost of hiring an attorney, all of those different things exist. Our goal should be to maximize compliance with the law while minimizing litigation. This provision maximizes litigation, particularly at the expense of judicial efficiency. It is notable that the draft text considered at last week's subcommittee hearing recognized this very issue to an extent. Section 402C of the draft bill specifically granted enforcement privacy to the FTC over state attorneys general. No state authority could institute a civil action against a defendant if the FTC decided to pursue that claim. This is a provision that is commonly found in federal legislation that grants enforcement power to both the FTC and state authorities. 
Unfortunately, the introduced version of the bill significantly limits FTC enforcement primacy. The new section 402C allows for state authorities to intervene in a civil action according to the rules of federal rules of civil procedure. So we have the possibility for the same conduct to be subject to an enforcement action by the FTC, state authorities, and private litigants all at the same time. I have to believe that Republicans will have significant concerns with such over-enforcement of a bill's provision. My, am my amendment would simply establish an enforcement primacy hierarchy. Simply put, the FTC would have enforcement primacy over state authorities, which in turn would have enforcement privacy over private litigants. This would provide reason to this would provide reason to the enforcement mechanism. And I want to be clear: I don't. I, I oppose the creation of a private right of action. However, I'm offering the amendment as a good faith attempt to legislate within the framework of the bill drafted by both the chairman and the ranking member. This is a reasonable amendment to ensure that the enforcement of allegations of prohibited conduct are addressed in an efficient manner, whether it be by the FTC, state, or private litigants, but just simply not all three at once. It's unreasonable to threaten multiple government enforcement actions and private claims on the same prohibited conduct when one enforcement mechanism would suffice. And again, I'm gonna withdraw the amendment. I just think it's easier to offer these because narrowly tailoring how we do the enforcement provisions is easier than me going on a rant, which I'm, anybody who knows me knows I'm willing to do. So with that, I'll, I'll withdraw the amendment and yield back. The, uh, the gentleman um, withdraws his amendment. Um, are there any members who s seek to be recognized to offer an amendment at this time? I have one more. Madam Chair, number Mr. 33. Arm Mr. Armstrong is recognized and the clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 8152 offered by Mr. Armstrong of North Dakota. Page 111, strike line 22, and all that follows through Without page 112. Without objection, um, the reading of the amendment will be dispensed with at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're uh, recognized for five minutes. The bill's right to cure provision is extremely limited. First, it is only offered as a remedy to address civil actions pursued by private litigants under the private right of action. Second, it is only applicable to injunctive relief. Finally, it's only applicable to allegations of certain violations in the bill regarding small businesses. Our goal should be to maximize compliance with the law and minimize litigation. A comprehensive right to a cure accomplishes both those goals. Parties should have the opportunity to achieve compliance prior to facing litigation. We've seen time after time the role of heavy-handed enforcement mechanisms play in implementing federal policy. Instead of working with businesses to provide a time-limited opportunity to achieve adherence, Congress often shoehorns organizations into compliance by opening the floodgates to entirely new classes of legal action that result in endless litigation and predatory sue-and-settle tactics. We should not be incentivizing activist litigation under the guise of achieving efficient compliance. Rather, we should build in incentives to support businesses that seek to correct honest honest instances of noncompliance and leave all parties in a better position to remain within the confines of the law. Whether a claim is brought by the FTC, relevant state authorities, or private litigants, businesses deserve the opportunity to resolve legitimate concerns before heading to the courtroom for monetary remedy or injunctive relief. And to be clear, the right to cure is not an end-all, be-all mechanism to achieve compliance. We know that there are entities that will require more substantial enforcement mechanisms, but these businesses represent a small minority of actors that would require intervention through the courts to enforce specific requirements of the law. The California Consumer Privacy Act provided a 30-day right to cure that was successfully used to promote compliance until it was eliminated in 2022. The California Attorney General bragged that in the first year, 75% of businesses notified of an allegation came to compliance within 30 days. Taking what we have learned about the benefits of right to cure over the last seven decades and applying it in this instance will allow recognition of honest mistakes, incentivize compliance, and prevent act activist litigation. My amendment would expand the bill's right to cure to cover all actions, whether it be by the FTC, state authorities, or private litigants. Again, our efforts to promote compliance with this law should be, not be limited to certain claims or certain covered entities. The amendment would also retain the current 45-day timeline to implement the cure. I, it would retain the current standard that a court may reasonably dismiss an action if the cure was implemented. And finally, it would return the current provision that the right to cure should not be applied more than once to address the same alleged conduct by the same covered entity. 
And as we continue to move down this, this bill is going to be litigated. It's just too big, too all-encompassing not to. Our goal should just simply be to get as much compliance as possible and do it in a way that doesn't hamper particularly small businesses. So again, I'm going to withdraw the amendment. Uh, I appreciate your indulgence, Madam Chair, and I yield back. The gentleman um, yields back. If there is no further discussion or amendment, we will proceed to a vote on the amendment in the nature of a substitute. All those in favor of the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 8152 um, as, uh, as um, will signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposing will say nay. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 8152 is agreed to. The question now uh, occurs on favorably forwarding H.R. 8152 as amended to the full committee. All those in favor of for forwarding H.R. 8152 as amended to the full committee will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed by saying no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And H.R. 8152, as amended, is forwarded to the full committee. Okay, moving on. The, uh, the chair calls up H.R. 3355, the Save American, what, what is that? American, okay. Um, the uh, chair uh, now calls up H.R. 3355, the Save Americans Forgotten Equine Act of 2021, or otherwise known as the SAFE Act. The clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 3355, a bill to amend the Horse Protection Act to prohibit the shipping, transporting, moving, delivering, receiving, possessing, purchasing, Without selling. Without objections, the first reading of the bill will be dispensed with. The bill is now um, considered uh, as the, uh, now, the bill is now considered as read. Um, without objection, the bill is considered as read and open to amendment at any time. Are there uh, any mem members seeking recognition to speak on H.R. 3355? Uh, Or someone? I, I do. Yeah, yeah. Do the Madam Chair? Mr. Armstrong wants to speak. Mr. Armstrong, you uh, are recognized. I have an amendment at the desk. She oh, she's gonna do oh, okay. She's no, we haven't we haven't gone to uh, on Ames yet. Recognize yourself after the amendment. I uh, now recognize myself to offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3355 offered by Ms. Schakowsky of Illinois. Strike all after the enacting clause and insert the following. Section 1, short title. This act may be cited as the Save America's Forgotten Equines Act of 2022 or the SAFE Act of 2022. Section 2. 
Prohibition on shipping, transporting, moving, delivering, receiving, possessing, purchasing, selling. Without objection, the uh, reading of the amendment will be dispensed with. And now I recognize myself to strike the last word. As a, as a former horse owner myself, I feel um, pretty um, passionate about this, uh, this legislation. Last year, over 36,000 horses were transferred from the United States to bordering, um, uh, bordering countries for one reason alone. It was for slaughter and slaughter for the purpose of their finding, uh, finally ending up for human consumption, for eating horse meat. Uh, we don't raise horses for, for food. They are our companions, um, our work partners, um, and um, they are uh, amazing um, athletes um, that, that, we, um, that we love very much. Um, horse slaughter is, um, uh, it's basically just plain old cruel. The animals often suffer long journeys to the slaughter plants without adequate food or water or rest. Um, at, by the time they get there, many have been brutalized um, and some are even dead at the time um, because they are hurt on the, uh, uh, on the journey. Um, and um, we also know that horse slaughter harms horse owners as well as horses. Um, the horse slaughter industry incentivizes horse, um, horse theft and predatory behavior and, uh, and, and fraud. Um, and we want to make sure that horse owners um, will not have to live in fear that their trusted equine partners are um, one just bad sale away from, from, from slaughter. And it is also true um, that um, horses, um, that, that horse meat can be toxic to, to human beings. Um, because horses are not raised for food, this is, this is not an animal that is bred to be um, slaughtered for, for food. They are routinely given literally hundreds of drugs over their lives that are uh, prohibited by the Food and Drug Administration, by being used in animals um, that are used for, for food. This can be very dangerous. Um, those drugs um, uh, are, are unsafe for, for human beings. So for all of, those, uh, all of those reasons and in respect for um, horses who play a very um, uplifting and important role, I think, in US culture, we want to make sure that they are not uh, allowed to be transferred for slaughter. I know that in Illinois, one of the very last slaughter plants, horse slaughter plants, finally closed some years ago. There was a, an, a concerted effort to make that happen. But now they are still in the United States of America being shipped out at numbers, as I mentioned, 36,000 horses um, were trafficked last uh, fr from the United States. Um, and we want to stop that. Um, and with that, uh, I, yield, I yield back and uh, recognize, see if there's anyone who, else who wants to speak on the, on the bill at this point. If not, we'll go to Mr. Armstrong. Madam Chair. If not, uh, yeah. I have, a, I have if, an amendment at the I'm desk. sorry. If not, I, have, I will recognize uh, for um, amendment um, Mr. Armstrong. Thank you, Madam I'm Chair. Sorry. The clerk, but first the clerk will, uh, will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3355, offered by Mr. Armstrong of North Dakota. Page 3, line 21, strike, has reason to believe Without and insert Without objection, no's. 
the reading of the amendment will be dispensed with. Mr. Armstrong, you're recognized. Five Thank minutes. you, Madam Chair. H.R. 3355 generally prohibits the facilitating the transfer or receipt of a horse or other equine if the person has reason to believe that the animal will be slaughtered for human consumption. My amendment is a small change, but it's a significant <clears throat> change. And it would change the required mental state from has reason to believe to knows. The reason to believe mental state is used sparingly in federal criminal code and for good reason. It's a confusing standard without clear definitions that imparts both subjective and objective elements. Courts have repeatedly struggled with this ill-defined standard as it includes both objective reasonable person elements and actual knowledge elements. Some courts lean to the objective standard, others lead to the knowledge standard, and some courts have created a hybrid subjective objective standard. Regardless, the result is confusion and unequal application of federal criminal law. The adoption of the knowledge mental state would clearly distinguish, distinguish the conduct that, conduct that Congress seeks to address. It would ensure that these prohibi prohibitions cover individuals who are willfully engaged in or specifically intend to commit the prohibited conduct. These individuals have an awareness or conscious purpose to engage in the illegally identified conduct. Further, Courts have a clear understanding and the definition of a knowledge mental state requirement, which is a commonly applied in criminal proceedings. This is why the related Senate bill requires knowledge and mental state. It is why the committee should adopt my amendment to HR 3355. There's been a lot of discussion about overcriminalization in re recent years, particularly the expansion of the federal criminal code. HR 3355, as introduced, is an example of that overcriminalization. We're serious about criminal justice reform. We need to address prom problematic texts like this mental state. We can't rely on comprehensive criminal justice packages like the First Step Act that come around once in a generation. It doesn't matter that this isn't the Judiciary Committee. We all have a duty to ensure the federal criminal code works in a clear and consistent manner. And there's a real risk that as drafted, the reason to believe men's ray is unconstitutional. And you don't have to take my word for it. In Rogers v. Tennessee, the Supreme Court of the United States held that core due process concepts require notice, foreseeability, and in particular, the right to fair warning that the conducts bear on the constitutionality of attaching criminal penalties to what previously had been innocent conduct. We are certainly considering the criminalization of what was previously not a crime, and the court has also <laughs> held that mens rea interpretation reflects the general principle that wrongdoing must be conscious to be criminal. And uh, this, this amendment would do that, and with that, I yield back. What do I say about this? No. I see you. I see you. I see you. Mr. Armstrong, I understand totally um, what you're saying. I would respectfully ask if you would consider withdrawing the amendment for this time with a firm commitment that we can work together and talk about this. I think we're essentially on the same page here when it comes to horse slaughter, but I'd like the opportunity to, to work with you on the nature of your amendment. Yes, ma'am. I'll withdraw. I appreciate that. Thank you. The gentleman withdraw. Are there uh, any other uh, members who seek recognition to offer an amendment um, to, to the amendment right now? Okay, so um, if there is no further discussion um, or amendments, Madam that, Chair, yes. Yeah, I'd like to speak on the strike the last word. The gentleman is uh, Mr. Bilirakis is recognized to strike the last word. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it very much. I, I, I move to strike the last word. I want to. Uh, Thank you for offering up your bill, H.R. 3355, the Save America's Forgotten uh, Equines Act, or the SAFE Act, and the AINS, which I plan on supporting. Uh, and I appreciate your leadership, uh, Madam Chair, on this particular issue. I know this is a bill that's very important to my constituents and myself in my district that are particularly passionate about horses. Uh, I believe that animals should be treated in a compassionate and humane manner and have always been willing to support practicable efforts to achieve that goal, including penalties for mistreatment or cruelty of animals. 
There is no excuse for allowing any animal to needlessly suffer in any inappropriate or inhumane way, and I've led caucuses uh, for the humane bond in the past that seek to strengthen the bonds between people and animals in all types of settings. They truly are, uh, really they are miracle workers, particularly for our veterans. Although slaughter of horses for human consumption is currently illegal in the United States, the ban is temporary uh, and uh, subject to annual review. And no federal law prohibits the transport of horses across our borders for this particular purpose. That's where the SAFE Act comes in, which will prohibit the interstate commerce, uh, the interstate commerce and sale of horses if the pe person has reason to believe they will be slaughtered for human consumption. I think we all share the goals outlined in the bill to try to prevent unnecessary horse slaughter and humane consumption of horse meat. However, I do know, and I want to be respectful of feedback with, uh, that we've received, including from tribal communities about wild grazing and vegetation on the public, uh, public land and public tribal lands as well, we should be careful to avoid unintended consequences, especially with those in rural and Western communities. I'm also aware, uh, again, uh, Representative Armstrong is presenting an amendment, as he did, and thank you so very much, Madam Chair, uh, for working with him on this particular issue. I'm hopeful we can work out the, an agreement uh, before full committee to keep the balance of raising and treating our horses humanely and preventing horse slaughter as much as we possibly can. Uh, with that, I support the AINS and I support the underlying bill and I encourage my colleagues to vote the same. Thank you and I yield back, Madam Chair. The, uh, the gentleman um, yields back. Um, I just wanted to make a, a brief announcement. Um, I am very happy to offer a pizza lunch um, for, on the Republican and the Democratic side, just to know. I believe it has arrived. Um, but we have important work to do. So if there is no um, further discussion um, or amendments, then we will proceed to a... Yes. On behalf of my members, I thank you for the pizza lunch. <laughs> you are very, very welcome. Um, let me begin that again. If there is no further discussion or amendments, we will proceed to a vote on the amendment in the nature of a substitute. All those in favor of an amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3355 will signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed will say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The uh, amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3355 is agreed to. Madam Chairman, I hear you, Mr. Madam Rush. Yes. Madam Chairman, I was trying to unmute. Uh, how am I recording? This is a voice. This is, this is a voice vote. So, uh, do I hear your eye? No. Madam okay. Chairman, uh, Good. Thank no, you very much. No, okay. No, um, no, so no, the, uh, the the I'm amendment a, now. The, yeah. The the uh, amendment has uh, now been um, agreed to. The, uh, the, the question um, now occurred, um, now occurs on favorably forwarding um, H.R. 3355 as amended to the full committee. I'm sorry? Okay, so there is no request for a uh, recorded vote. Okay, so then all those in uh, favor of forwarding H.R. 3355 as amended to the full committee will signify 
by saying aye. 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 All those opposed by saying no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And the and HR 3355, as amended, is now forwarded to the full committee. Okay. I can get all these down, right? Yeah. Everything down? The chair um, now calls up H.R. 3962, the Securing and Enabling Commerce Using uh, uh, Remote and Electronic Notarization Act of 2021. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 3962, a bill to authorize notaries public to perform and to establish minimum standards Without for... Without objection, the uh, first reading of the bill will be dispensed with, and the bill is now open for consideration as read. Without objection, the, uh, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any time, at any point. Are there any members who uh, seek recognition to offer any amendment? Is there anyone who wants no. to speak to this uh, legislation? Armstrong, Armstrong, Armstrong. I, I think I also, okay, Mr. Armstrong was first. Okay, go ahead. Mr. Armstrong, you're recognized. Madam Chair, I move to strike the last word. As discussed in our legislative markup last month, we have the capability and technology to accomplish meetings, events, and social outings remotely. Even, conduct, even Congress conducts business remotely. For example, today's hearing is a markup hybrid. With members able to participate from in the committee room or anywhere else for that matter. H.R. 3962, the SECURE Act, is legislation to permit the nationwide use of remote online notarizations, which is simply an electronic notarization where the party are, and notary are in different locations. This bipartisan bill would provide business and consumers with the ability to execute documents using two-way audiovisual communication while protecting consumers with multi-factor authentication of the signer and use of tamper-evident technology. Requirements for a signer to be physically in the presence of a notary are often impractical and sometimes impossible, such as with military deployments or travel restrictions. Remote online notarization increases the use of notarization and allows individuals to conduct crucial business if they are unable to be physically in front of a notary. More than 40 states have enacted laws or temporary waivers allowing the use of remote online notarization. This bill would not preempt or replace the state laws the states have enacted, <laughs> but instead would provide for the interstate recognition of notarizations performed under other states' laws. This is similar to the full faith and credit clause in implementing statutes that ensure the recognition of things like records and judicial proceedings produced in other states. I'd like to close by noting that no objection to this bill were raised during the subcommittee's legislative hearing on May 26th. Additionally, this bill was unanimously added to the House passed National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2022, although it was not enacted. I urge my colleagues to support this legislation, and with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. If there are no further uh, speakers on this bill, then the question now occurs on favorably forwarding H.R. 3962 um, to the full committee. Well, we'll do it. There, a, a recorded vote has been um, asked for. The, uh, and so a recorded vote has been ordered. Those in favor, those uh, in, in favor of forwarding, is that, oh, is that where we're at? Okay. 
uh, those in, for, in favor of forwarding HR 3962 to the full committee will say aye. 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 Those uh, opposed will, will say no. Um, and the clerk shall call the roll. Mr. Rush. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes aye. Mr. Han. Mr. Han votes aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes aye. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes aye. Mr. Cardenas. Cardenas, aye. Mr. Cardenas votes aye. Mrs. Dingle. Dingle votes aye. Mrs. Dingle votes aye. Ms. Kelly. Ms. Kelly, you're on mute. I'm a yes. Ms. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Soto. Mr. Soto votes aye. Ms. Rice. Rice votes aye. Ms. Rice votes aye. Ms. Craig. Ms. Fletcher. Fletcher votes aye. Ms. Fletcher votes aye. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes aye. Mr. Bilirakis. Mr. Bilirakis votes aye. Mr. Upton. Is this what I'm supposed to say? Ms. Tchaikovsky from Illinois votes aye? Mr. Upton votes aye. Mr. Upton votes aye. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes aye. Mr. Guthrie. Mr. Guthrie votes aye. Mr. Bouchon. Mr. Bouchon votes aye. Mr. Dunn. Mr. Dunn votes aye. Ms. Lesko. Aye. Ms. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Pence. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong votes aye. Mrs. Rogers. Mrs. Rogers votes aye. Chairwoman Schakowsky. Votes aye. Chairwoman Schakowsky votes aye. Madam Chair. Oh, Mr. Rush? Madam Chair, how am I recorded? Mr. Rush is not recorded. Rush votes aye. Mr. Rush votes aye. I think we can, I think we can actually assure people there's nobody else. Because he's not recorded. Is there, is there anyone else who is, uh, who is not recorded, who wishes to be recorded? Does any member uh, wish to uh, change his or her vote? If not, the clerk will report the tally. On that vote, Madam Chairwoman, the yeas were 22 and the nays were zero. Then, um, 22. 22A. I'm sorry, 22 to zero. And HR 3962 is now forwarded to the full committee. So now the, uh, the chair um, calls up HR 4081, the in, uh, in informing consum consumers about small Devices Act. The, uh, the clerk will report the bill. HR 4081, a bill to require the disclosure of a camera recording capability in certain internet connected devices. Without objection, the first reading of the bill will be dispensed with. The bill is now considered as read. Without objection, um, the bill is now considered as read and is open for amendment at any time, at any point. Are there any members that are seeking recognition to speak on HR 4080, uh, 4081? Mr. Bilirakis, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it very much. Uh, I move to strike the last word. 
I strongly support H.R. 4081, the Informing Consumers and Smart Devices Act, and I want to thank Representative Curtis, who's a member of the full committee, uh, and Representative Moulton for their leadership in sponsoring this legislation. In fact, I was proud to be an original co-lead on this bill last Congress before becoming the Republican leader of the subcommittee, so I'm certainly familiar with the issue. Uh, this legislation will require manufacturers of internet-connected devices like smart TVs or other smart appliances like kitchenware and uh, IOT devices, the Internet of Things, almost everything, to disclose to consumers that a camera or a microphone is part of that device. We live in an increasingly connected world with additional features and innovation like we've never seen before. Yet not every device is known or expected by consumers to have microphones or cameras in them. So this is a common sense consumer transparency bill that will ensure Americans know what devices have the capability of listening to or recording them. As you know, Madam Chair, uh, holding big tech accountable, as you've said this many times, has been a priority, of course, for Republicans as well and for Leader Rogers throughout this Congress. And I believe this legislation will help us move towards accomplishing that particular goal, especially in light of the privacy uh, discussions we've been having over the past few months. So uh, I urge my colleagues to vote for this particular bill. Uh, I support it very much. I strongly support it. I will request a recorded vote when that happens. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Are there um, any other members seeking yes. recognition? Yes, yes. yes, yes Madam yes. Chair. I move to strike the last. Representative Lesko, you're uh, recognized. Thank you. I move to strike the last word. Um, I really support this legislation. I, I think it's um, very much needed. And I'm probably going to introduce a related legislation. Um, we had, I just want to share with you uh, in our house, we have uh, security cameras yeah, outside and inside, but um, they call back uh, to China, we've discovered. Uh, and so uh, my husband had to do something so that it wasn't calling back to China, but also we discovered at least one of them, which we replaced, had a microphone in it. And so it was not only um, doing camera, but microphone when the camera was not on. This is very concerning, and especially if it's calling back to China. I really don't want China monitoring me and listening into me. So um, I'll probably do legislation. Hopefully we can get bipartisan support. Thank you. The gentlewoman yields back. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? No? Then the, uh, the question um, now occurs on favorably reporting H.R. 4081 to the full committee. I'm sorry. Yeah, a recorded vote has, uh, has been requested. First, uh, I ask all those uh, in favor um, of forwarding H.R. 4081 um, to the full committee will first signify by saying aye, and the uh, aye, and the uh, all, all those uh, opposed, no. And now we will have a recorded vote, and the clerk shall call the roll. All right. I got it. I got to do a recorded vote here, so hang on. I got to move to a better location where I can get a better reception. Mr. Rush. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes aye. Ms. Trahan. Ms. Trahan votes aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes aye. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes aye. Mr. Cardenas. Cardenas from California votes aye. Mr. Cardenas votes aye. Mrs. Dingle. Dingle votes aye. Mrs. Dingle votes aye. Miss Kelly. Kelly votes aye. Miss Kelly votes aye. Mr. Soto. Mr. Soto votes aye. Miss Rice. Rice votes aye. Miss Rice votes aye. Miss Craig. Miss Fletcher. 
Fletcher votes aye. Ms. Fletcher votes aye. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Bilirakis. Mr. Mr. Bilirakis votes aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton votes aye. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes aye. Mr. Guthrie. Mr. Guthrie votes aye. Mr. Bouchon. Mr. Bouchon votes aye. Mr. Dunn. Mr. Dunn votes aye. Ms. Lesko. Ms. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Pence. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong votes aye. Mrs. Rogers. Mrs. Rogers votes aye. Chairwoman Schakowsky. Votes aye. Chairwoman Schakowsky votes aye. Does, does any member wish to uh, change Mr. his Chair. vote? Yes. Madam Mr. Chair. Mr. Rush? Madam Chair, am I recorded? Mr. Rush is not recorded. Rush votes aye. Mr. Rush votes aye. So the, uh, the clerk will report the tally. On that vote, Madam Chairwoman, the yeas were 21 and the nays were zero. On that vote, the uh, yeas are 21 and the nays are zero. The, um, in the, on oh, um, HR 40, 81 is now forwarded to the full committee. We are moving right along. The chair now calls up HR 4551, the reporting attacks from national, no, from, uh, from, from nations selected for overseas and, what is that, monitoring? Over, oh, for oversight and monitoring. Let me say that again. The chair calls up HR 4551, the reporting attacks from nations selected by overseas oversight and monitoring web attacks. Is that right now? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and ransom. And ransomware. Sorry. From enemies out. From what is that? From enemies out. Okay. Okay, from Enemies Act. I'm gonna do it one more time because it's a long name. We'll just say this, the ransomware. How about the ransomware act? Um, the clerk will uh, will report the bill. HR forty five fifty one, a bill to amend the safe the U.S. State Safe Web Act of 2006 to provide for Without reporting. Without objection, the, uh, the first reading of the bill will be dispensed with. The bill is now uh, open for consideration, uh, is now considered as read. Um, without uh, objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any time. Are there... Uh, any members seeking recognition to speak on H.R. 4551? Mr. Bilirakis. Madam Chair. Mr. Bilirakis. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, I move to strike the last word. I want to thank you for including my bill on the docket today, H.R. 4551, the Ransomware Act. Our subcommittee has a long history of coming together in a bipartisan fashion to help keep Americans safe from cybersecurity attacks and other bad actors, which is why we created the U.S. Safe Web Act, a law that gives the FTC the tools and authority needed to work with foreign law enforcement agencies and support investigations and in, uh, enforcement actions to bad actors. We came together last Congress through the leadership of the ranking member, um, Ms. Rogers, and Representative Kelly, as well as you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate that so much, to reauthorize a safe web program to allow FTC to continue to protect consumers 
from, from cross-border fraud and deception occurring online over the internet. The FTC should continue to collaborate with law enforcement partners overseas to strengthen its important consumer protection work for us here in the United States. And yet, the dangers of cybersecurity threats continue on a daily basis, unfortunately, particularly when it comes to ransom attacks. I mentioned in my opening statement that Chinese government that the Chinese government hacked into our telecommunication systems and other infrastructure. The example that uh, Representative Lasco gave just now, uh, it's, it's really unacceptable. And, and last year, we saw how critical this issue is with the force shutdown of the colonial pipeline via ransomware or when a foreign hacking group targeted hospitals and clinics with ransomware. One frightening incident we've seen overseas is in Costa Rica, which has been battered by cyber attacks from foreign hackers claiming they want to overthrow the government. Now is the time for us to continue our bipartisan spirit by moving forward uh, with my ransomware bill, uh, which will require the FTC to report on cross-border complaints involving ransomware and other cyber-related incidents, specifically from our uh, adversaries uh, like China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and others. Russia, in particular, has been an incredibly bad actor in the cyberspace, and this bill will go a long way in learning how prevalent the problem is and how we can uh, begin to counteract these threats. This is very timely. We've got to get this across the finish line as soon as possible. I urge my colleagues, again, to support this bill and move it forward. Uh, and I will, at the time, uh, uh, request a recorded vote, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Are there others who would like to speak on this bill? Okay. Then the uh, question now occurs on favorably forwarding H.R. 4551 to the full committee. Um, and the uh, request uh, has been made for a recorded vote. A recorded vote is in order. Um, those uh, in favor of H.R. 4551. Um, oh, yes, right. Um, to the full committee will say aye, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Rush. Rush votes aye. Mr. Rush votes aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes aye. Ms. Trahan. Mr. McNerney. Aye. Mr. McNerney votes aye. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes aye. Mr. Cardenas. Cardenas from California votes aye. Mr. Cardenas votes aye. Mrs. Dingle. Dingle votes aye. Mrs. Dingle votes aye. Ms. Kelly. Kelly votes aye. Ms. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Soto. Soto votes aye. Mr. Soto votes aye. Ms. Rice. Rice votes aye. Ms. Rice votes aye. Ms. Craig. Ms. Craig votes aye. Ms. Craig votes aye. Ms. Fletcher. Fletcher votes aye. Ms. Fletcher votes aye. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes aye. Mr. Bilirakis. Aye. Mr. Bilirakis votes aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton votes aye. Mr. Latta. How are you? Mr. Latta votes aye. Mr. Guthrie. Mr. Guthrie votes aye. Mr. Bouchon. Mr. Bouchon votes aye. Mr. Dunn. Mr. Dunn votes aye. Ms. Lesko. Ms. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Pence. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong votes aye. Mrs. Rogers. Mrs. Rogers votes aye. Chairwoman Schakowsky. Votes aye. Chairwoman Schakowsky votes aye. The, uh, does that, does any, uh, anybody uh, wish to change his or her vote? If not, the clerk will report the tally. On that vote, Madam Chairwoman, the yeas were 22 and the nays were zero. The vote is 22 ayes, 
and zero nays. So HR 4551 um, is forwarded to the full committee. The chair um, now calls up HR 5313, Reese's Law. The clerk will report the title of the bill. HR 5313, a bill to protect children and other consumers against hazards associated with the Without accidental. Without objection, the first reading of the bill will be dispensed with. The bill is now considered as read. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open to amendment at any time. Madam Chair, I have an amendment in the nature of a substitute at the desk. I now uh, recognize um, Ms. Kelly to offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Thank you, Madam Chair. My amendment in the nature of a substitute makes the, conforming the clerk, edit. First, the, the clerk oh, will, uh, will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 5313 offered by Ms. Kelly of Illinois. Strike all after the enacting clause and insert the Without following. Without objection, the reading of the amendment will be dispensed with, um, and Ms. Kelly is now recognized uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. My amendment in the nature of a substitute makes conforming edits to H.R. 5313 so that it matches the text of the Senate companion to Reese's Law S3278, which passed favorably out of the Senate Commerce, Science and Transportation Committee in May. This bipartisan bill will save countless lives. Today, children can get to these small button batteries easily in toys and remotes and many other everyday items, which is what happened with Reese Hamsmith, the namesake of this bill. More than 3,000 children in ingest button batteries every year. The health impacts of swallowing can be severe and in many cases result in death. These instances are on the rise and addressing this issue cannot wait any longer. This bill requires the Consumer Product Safety Commission to create standards for button cell and coin batteries to prevent accidental ingestion by children six years old and younger. Under the new standard, manufacturers will be required to make compartments containing button batteries more secure and to include warning labels on the packaging of button cell batteries and the consumer products that contain them. For all of these reasons, this is an important amendment and a worthwhile bill. I urge my colleagues to support it. With that, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. Are there other members who are seeking recognition to speak on the bill? Mr. Bilirakis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to strike the last word. I'll be brief, but I just want to reiterate my support for this legislation and thank the leadership, again, Representative Kelly and Arrington, but also uh, Representative Rutherford from the great state of Florida worked very hard on this bill as well. Uh, what happened to Reese was a tragedy, and I shared my condolences and, and know we can do better to help prevent these tragedies from happening again to other children in the future. I've been inspired by the work of Trista Hamsmith, who has been willing to share her daughter's tragic story and channel it into action. Reese's law would require the Consumer Protection Safety Commission to establish safety standards to protect children from uh, ingesting uh, button cell batteries. Uh, it also includes an education component for consumers to ensure they're keeping new and used batteries out of the reach of children. With the jurisdiction over the CPCSC, our subcommittee must take our consumer protection role seriously, and we have. And I believe this bill and the AIMS, uh, and the AIMS will do just that by better protecting uh, people against risks of injury or death associated with consumer products. Without uh, without, of course, burdening our innovators uh, and our businesses. We can still go after potential harms and ensure our constituents, particularly our children, are kept safe. And with that, I'll yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. 
The gentleman yields back. I recognize um, myself to strike the last word. Um, I am, um, I, I think about the testimony of um, Risa's mom, Trista, who came here and uh, told about how essentially there was um, a hole in her daughter's body. Um, and it didn't happen all at once. They tried and tried, um, and there was no way to um, save this baby. Um, you know, I, I just also want to mention that so many of the things that we do in our consumer protection subcommittee has relied on parents who are willing to come and despite the tragedy, tell their stories. And as a consequence, then we're able to turn around and do something about it. And I want to thank Congresswoman Kelly and all those who have supported um, this, this legislation for, uh, for, for moving ahead. And I certainly want to encourage everyone to join in in, um, in endorsing this and, and let's try and address this problem as soon as possible. Um, you know, this is, this, is, this is happening. It is not, this was not a, uh, a, a one-off and, you know, there are children that have continued to be um, harmed by um, those tiny batteries. And so we have an opportunity today to act. And with that, I yield back and ask if there are others who want to uh, speak to. Last Madam Chair, I move to strike the last one. Oh, you're recognized. Thank you. Madam Chair, I share your concern and support of this bill. I have five grandkids. Um, three of them are young. Uh, and this is, this is a problem. And so we need to, to fix it. I, I represent areas in the Phoenix metropolitan area in Congress. And one of those cities is Glendale, Arizona. And in Glendale, Arizona, we had a one-year-old child named Alexander Ellis who ended up in the hospital and suffered injuries after ingesting a button battery from the handle of a Halloween basket. Um, the Glendale family rushed Alexander to Banner Thunderbird Medical Center, uh, where it was confirmed the battery was in his stomach. His mom took him to Phoenix Children's uh, Medical Center, where he was admitted. The battery was removed. He suffered oozing, bleeding, and burns in his stomach. Um, another uh, Arizona family, Carl and Michael Rausch from Phoenix, organized the Foundation Emmett's Fight to share their story, educate families, parents, caregivers, and grandparents about the dangers of button battery ingestion. Their son, Emmett, ingested a battery from a DVD player remote control. He suffered from two holes burned into his esophagus, and, and the battery was lodged one centimeter from his heart. He also endured many surgeries. Um, I'm glad the sponsor, I say thank you to the sponsors of this bill, and I support it, and I yield back. Are there any other members who would like to speak to this legislation? No? Okay. Okay. Um, if there is no further discussion um, uh, or uh, amendments, no? Okay. Then uh, we will proceed to vote on the amendment in the nature of a substitute. All those in favor? of the amendment and the nature of a substitute to HR 5313 will uh, signify by saying aye. 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 All aye. those opposed? Aye. All those opposed will say nay. Yeah. In the opinion of the I chair, yeah. the ayes stop it. A recorded vote has been asked. Okay. The, uh, the question now occurs on favorably reporting HR 5313 as amended to the, uh, the, the full committee. Okay. No problem. No problem. Recorded uh, vote. Is, a, a recorded, I'm sorry. A recorded vote is ordered. Uh, those in favor of forwarding HR 5313 as amended 
um, to the full committee will signify by saying by saying aye. Um, those opposed, nay, and the clerk will call the roll. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Flight 1591 with nonstop service to Denver, Colorado. And Some, please someone's please. not on mute. I, in the overhead bins, we'll first. Here is the key. All color jackets, backpacks, and bags. Anyone who's, who is not on mute needs to get on mute. Mr. Rush. Rush votes aye. Mr. Rush votes aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes aye. Ms. Trahan. Ms. Trahan votes aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes aye. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes aye. Mr. Cardenas. Cardenas in California votes aye. Thank you so much, Robin Kelly. Mr. Cardenas votes aye. Mrs. Dingle. Dingle votes aye. Mrs. Dingle votes aye. Miss Kelly. Kelly votes aye. Miss Kelly votes aye. Mr. Soto. Soto votes aye. Mr. Soto votes aye. Miss Rice. Rice votes aye. Miss Rice votes aye. Miss Craig. Miss Fletcher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes aye. Mr. Bilarakis. Mr. Bilarakis votes aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton votes aye. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes aye. Mr. Guthrie. Mr. Guthrie votes aye. Mr. Bouchon. Mr. Bouchon votes aye. Mr. Dunn. Mr. Dunn votes aye. Ms. Lesko. Ms. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Pence. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong votes aye. Mrs. Rogers. Mrs. Rogers votes aye. Chairwoman Schakowsky. Votes aye. Chairwoman Schakowsky votes aye. The clerk will report the vote. The what? On that vote, Madam Chairwoman, the yeas were 21 and the nays were zero. The vote is 21 ayes and zero nays. HR 5313 is, as, uh, as amended is forwarded to the full committee. This is the next to last. Um, and the, uh, the chair calls HR. 5441, the, um, the prevent all let me read soaring, tactics, yeah. soaring Tactics Act of uh, 2021 or the Past Act, the, uh, the clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 5441, a bill to amend the Horse Protection Act to designate additional unlawful acts under the Act. Without objection, the first reading of the bill will be dispensed with, and the bill is now open for discussion. For consideration. Is there anyone who wishes to speak on the bill? I recognize uh, myself to. Uh, oh, 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 I have the names. Okay. Um, I now recognize um, myself to offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 5441 offered by Ms. Schakowsky of Illinois. Strike all after the enacting clause and insert the following. Section 1, short title. This act may be cited as the Prevent All Soaring Tactics Act of 2022 or the Past Act of 2022. Section 2, Increased Enforcement Under Horse Protection Act. Without objection, the reading of the amendment will be dispensed with. Um, I recognize myself to uh, 
to speak on the amendment. So um, horse soaring is exactly what it sounds like. It is causing pain to horses deliberately. Those horses who we see in shows who are uh, proud to, uh, no, who are seen to lift their, their feet, Tennessee walking horses primarily, um, to look beautiful, the higher they raise, um, the more beautiful it is perceived often by the audiences that view them. But in many cases, in some cases for sure, the way that raised hoof, that raised leg, is achieved is by putting caustic chemicals around the feet of those horses so that they will raise their feet in pain in order to reward those who are watching with what is considered a beautiful performance. This is really torture. And it is time for us, you know, many of those horses quite naturally will raise their legs to some extent. That's the beauty of the, uh, of the walking horses. But the unusually high raising of the leg is often because of this kind of treatment of, of horses. There has been um, video that has been revealed that this has actually happened. We know that it exists and it is time to get rid of it. And this legislation would prohibit the soaring of, of horses and those of us, and I think that's most of us, who care about the well-being and the safety and the respect of these beautiful creatures, um, these animals, will say that it is time to say no to that kind of treatment. So I urge all of my colleagues to join in ending horse soaring and supporting this legislation. And with that, I, uh, I yield back. Is there anyone else who would like to uh, speak to this legislation? If there is uh, no further discussion um, or amendments, then we will proceed to a vote on the amendment in the nature of a substitute. All those who favor the amendment in the nature of the substitute to HR 5441 will uh, we'll signify by saying aye. 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 All those aye. Uh, opposed will say nay. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The question is now uh, now occurring in favor of forwarding H.R. 5441 as amended to the full committee. All those in favor, and I, I would actually like a roll call vote on, on this. All uh, in favor uh, will respond by saying aye, um, and those opposed nay, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Rush. Rush votes aye. Mr. Rush votes aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes aye. Ms. Trahan. Aye. Ms. Trahan votes aye. Mr. McNerney. Aye. Mr. McNerney votes aye. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes aye. Mr. Cardenas. Cardenas from California votes aye. Mr. Cardenas votes aye. Mrs. Dingle. Dingle votes aye. Mrs. Dingle votes aye. Ms. Kelly. Kelly votes aye. Ms. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Soto. Soto votes aye. Mr. Soto votes aye. Ms. Rice. Rice votes aye. Ms. Rice votes aye. Ms. Craig. Ms. Craig votes aye. Ms. Craig votes aye. Ms. Fletcher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes aye. Mr. Bilirakis. Aye. Mr. Bilirakis votes aye. Mr. Upton. Upton votes aye. Mr. Upton votes aye. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes aye. Mr. Guthrie. Aye. 
Mr. Guthrie votes aye. Mr. Bouchon. Mr. Bouchon votes aye. Mr. Dunn. Mr. Dunn votes aye. Ms. Lesko. Ms. Lesko votes aye. Mr. Pence. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong votes aye. Mrs. Rogers. Mrs. Rogers votes aye. Chairwoman Schakowsky. Votes aye. Chairwoman Schakowsky votes aye. The, uh, uh, the clerk will report the tally. On that vote, Madam Chairwoman, the yeas were 22 and the nays were zero. The vote is 22 aye and zero nay, and uh, HR 5441, as amended, is forwarded to the full committee. This is the last one. I think there's probably some pizza awaiting. Um, so it's cold pizza. It's cold. Well, I like it for breakfast right. anyway. Um, okay. The uh, the uh, chair calls up HR 6290, the Manufacturing.gov Act. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 6290, a bill to provide for the establishment of a section of the website. The full reading of the bill will be dispensed with. The bill is now considered as read. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Madam Chair, could I strike the last word? The gentleman is recognized to strike the last word. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the inclusion of Mr. Tonko's Manufacturing.gov Act, of which I'm an original co-sponsor. I want to thank him for his hard work. Uh, and of course, we will, I think we'll all be voting for it on a recorded vote in, in a few minutes. Uh, this is one of the several bills that the subcommittee has worked on to assist investment in businesses that in fact benefit entire communities. But I'm concerned that one particular bipartisan bill has been left behind this year that moved through on a supply chain related legislative hearing, uh, but it's not moved through the House like other bills uh, on that same hearing. That's H.R. 2907, the Global Investment in American Jobs Act of 21 that's led by colleagues uh, Pence and Bobby Rush, and joined by myself, Eshu, Long, Tonko, and Butterfield. I'm just curious to know if the chair has any particular concerns with the bill that we might address so that we can, we can move this bill as well. I would note that if your concern is on the investment from Chinese actors in American companies, I can assure you that as the former chairman of this committee and many on our side having worked on this legislation that you will in fact have our full cooperation. I have every confidence of that with Mr. Pence as well, who's not here today because of an illness. So I would hope that we could work together to address those concerns. I'd be interested if you might have a comment before I yield back. Thank you for, for raising that the, the issue and I'm more than happy to work with you on it. Um, and I appreciate your raising the question on its presence not being here, but we can go forward to Great. try and, and move the legislation. We've got some good players on both sides of the aisle so that we're interested in seeing this done. And with, with that, uh, I yield back and urge okay. uh, all my colleagues to vote on this, yes, on this bill before us. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Is there, yeah, is there uh, anyone else who seeks recognition? Ms. Rogers. Ms. Rogers, did you? Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, before we completely wrap up today's work, I wanted to recognize, I wanted a moment of personal privilege, please. Sure. Did I ask for that? Okay, personal privilege. General, the yes. gentlelwoman has a moment of personal okay, privilege. Okay, yes. personal privilege to recognize a very valued member of my team as it is his last day with the Energy and Commerce Committee, Mr. B.J. Kumari, Thank you all know. So B.J.'s been leading on the Oversight Committee as Chief Counsel, and then he also has been heading up our Big Tech Accountability Platform. So 
I hate to see him go. However, he's not going that far. And uh, as I always like to say, the best is yet to come for BJ and us. But uh, just thank you, BJ, for all your hard work. I've, you know, you all know he's pretty smart, pretty, pretty creative and uh, strategic when it comes to getting things done. And just appreciated your leadership and your friendship and wish you all the best. Thank you, everyone. I yield back. Thank you. I think all of us are all of us are so blessed with some such fabulous uh, staff and the hard work. And I think today is a good example of that. Um, we have uh, accomplished uh, a lot, even if not everything that we um, hope to do. Um, but this has been a a, a very uh, a very great day. Um, and the uh, question now occurs on favorably uh, reporting H.R. 6290 to the full committee. Uh, all those in favor of forwarding H.R. 6290, did you say you Yeah, wanted? we'd like to um, vote. Uh, will respond to a, uh, a, a roll call, a roll call vote, and the clerk will take the tally. Mr. Rush. Aye. Mr. Rush votes aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes aye. Ms. Trahan. Ms. Trahan votes aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes aye. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark votes aye. Mr. Cardenas. Cardenas from California votes aye. Mr. Cardenas votes aye. Mrs. Dingle. Dingle votes aye. Mrs. Dingle votes aye. Ms. Kelly. Kelly votes aye. Miss Kelly votes aye. Mr. Soto. Soto votes aye. Mr. Soto votes aye. Miss Rice. Rice votes aye. Miss Rice votes aye. Miss Craig. Craig votes aye. Miss Craig votes aye. Miss Fletcher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes aye. Mr. Bilarakis. Bilarakis votes aye. Mr. Bilarakis votes aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton votes aye. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes aye. Mr. Guthrie. Aye. Mr. Guthrie votes aye. Mr. Bouchon. Aye. Mr. Bouchon votes aye. Mr. Dunn. Aye. Mr. Dunn votes aye. Miss Lesko. Aye. Miss Lesko votes aye. Mr. Pence. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong votes aye. Mrs. Rogers. Mrs. Rogers votes aye. Chairwoman Schakowsky. Votes aye. Chairwoman Schakowsky votes aye. The, uh, the clerk will report the tally. On that vote, Madam Chairwoman, the yeas were 22 and the nays were zero. The, uh, the vote is uh, 22 to zero. The ayes um, have it. Um, and the... Uh, H.R. 6290 um, will be forwarded to the full committee. So that um, concludes all the bills that we have. I ask unanimous consent to enter 15 documents into the record. Hearing no objections, so ordered. Um, the chair, with, uh, without objection, um, the staff is authorized to make technical um, conforming changes to the bills consistent with the actions taken by the subcommittee uh, today. The, and at this point, I want to thank everyone for their participation. I wondered if my ranking member had any final uh, words. Yeah, I have a, a final word, and uh, this is a football phrase, of course. Uh, who does say E and C don't jam? Thank you very much for the opportunity. Appreciate thank, it. Thank you, uh, everyone. And uh, with that, the meeting of our subcommittee is adjourned. All right. Good job, Jane. Yay. Good job. Thank Yay. you very much. Yay. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Good job. I like your tie. Thank you, Mark. Thank Appreciate you, Gus. Thank this you. was good. Was yeah. Excellent. Oh, my goodness.